Right. Hello there. It's um, Jacob here from Authentic Gay Blog. This is a follow-up to to the review I did of It's a Sin. Now, to give some context, because I would imagine the majority of the younger gay and bisexual male community will have no idea whatsoever um, as to what it was like back then and may feel the program over dramatized things well I can tell you categorically it didn't okay so the three characters who died of HIV related conditions um, were all really quite different characters and they probably would actually accurately represent um, what was happening so the first one was Gloria who was a guy in his 30s who was a bus conductor on um, the London buses now there wasn't a lot of detail about his sex life so um, we don't really know what he was up to however you know he like a lot of men at the time when the virus was just becoming known um, in in a few countries of the world, America, the UK and some other European countries when people, when gay men primarily were starting to develop these illnesses that perplexed um, medical people all the time because they were conditions that would be associated with people who were in old age um, or of certain ethnic minorities, you know, so one being Carsopi, Car, uh, KS, which is Carsopi something, cancer basically, and they're the lesions, and they're normally associated with people who live in the Mediterranean. Mm. Yet guys in the UK were developing it, and it perplexed them. Mm. The primar primar primary one was pneumonia um, and lung conditions, specifically pneumonia. And they were wondering why guys were developing this this really serious case of pneumonia. Anyway, so in Gloria's case, that's what happens to Gloria. You know, he he develops pneumonia, gets better, gets sick again, gets better, gets sick again, and dies. Now that was the story. Guys got sick, they got better, they got sick, they got better. But um, every time they got sick, they got sicker and took longer to recover until they realized what was going on and they still didn't quite know how it was transmitted so it, even though there were rumors going around that it was sexually transmitted at the time the gay and bisexual male community were very resistant to changing their sexual behavior and they kind of thought that people were trying to stop them from having sex and they were lying about it you know, at one time they thought it was caused by poppers, you know. Um, so they didn't really know. It wasn't until time progressed that they realised that it was transmitted either through sex or or blood transfusions or sharing needles. That it was, um, you know, there was a specific route of transmission that had to take place. Although at the time the media especially in the uk was full of basically avoid gay men <laughs> don't go anywhere near a gay man because mm. you'll catch aids and it was really quite quite horrifying even in the 90s people still didn't know very much or people were they should know because the medical profession and all of the sexual health organizations were widely telling people how HIV was transmitted. However, I used to volunteer at the Terence Higgins Trust and I worked in, later on in the late 90s, I worked in the volunteer office. And even in like 1999, my friend was volunteering on the helpline and she came down to me. <laughs> and she said, I can't believe a call I've just taken. Someone's just rang up saying they sat on the same chair on the tube as a gay guy and had touched the metal bar of the tube 
where he typed had he got ha, had he contracted HIV. That was in 1999. So you can imagine what people were like in the 80s. So Colin, you know, and what happened with him with his stuff being burnt by his family? That happened. That really, 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 really did happen. People burnt everything that 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 the person owned because they were so scared of how catching HIV you know it, it wasn't until like I just said until the late 80s that people began to get a, a much clearer visage now that was mostly the reason that happened was mostly down to gay and bisexual men and their friends and allies you know the the, the, the very few straight people at the time we didn't have a problem with gay men who were friends and lost friends it was down to them getting off their asses because the government weren't doing it the conservative government of the time had their head in the hat in this and they didn't know what to do a bit like <laughs> how they're coping with the current coronavirus really you know it's not much difference um so that happened because in 1982, a gay man called Terence Higgins, Terence Higgins died at Prompton Hospital. And like the night after he died, a group of his friends got together um, in a club, I think it was in London, I think it might have been JY or Bang. And they got together and discussed what were they going to do? You know, how can we react? And this was a gay and bisexual male community. So they got together and they started doing the research and putting together the, the information and the Terence Higgins Trust came about and then other organisations came about as a result of that. Mm. Now, have to remember, this was when... when society was vehemently homophobic. You know, if you remember, if you've watched It's a Sin, at the end of it, the guy that infected Colin is in on the HIV ward and his mum comes in and says he's not a dirty queer he kind of done this you know that was in 1991 you know so we faced as a community we faced the worst levels of homophobia ever because because HIV was out there the media had a tool to beat us with you know so the papers were full of these stories you know queer dirty, filthy perverts, spreading AIDS, put them on an island, kill them, you know, this was every day in the press. You know, the, the levels of homophobia were through the roof. And as a community, we, we stuck, like in, that, in, in the programme, you know, they were very tight in their little unit in the house, looking after each other, taking care of each other. That is what it was like, because we had to do that. You know, we had to do that. We had to look after each other. We had no choice, you know. But we responded with, with strength. Such strength we showed in how we responded, you know. Now, the second character, Colin, that broke my heart when Colin died. Honestly, I, I had to stop watching the programme. I had to take a break for a couple of hours before I could watch episode four and five. When Colin died, that broke my heart, you know. And, you know, the perception, even in the gay community, the perception was, at the time, only the sluts would get HIV, you know. Only, only the whores and the people who were slagging about and having hundreds of sexual partners, they were the ones who were going to get AIDS and die, you know. That was what was happening. Now, Colin's story is, actually, he had sex with one person. You know, that was a context. At the end, you know, it was kind of, revealed that he'd had sex with the lodger's son his his landlady's son who's the lady who says my son's not a queer at the end you know so he the landlady's son carried shame about being gay and couldn't admit to being gay and he was really raping colin every week while she was out doing bingo or something and obviously Colin was attracted to him. Um, fuck knows why. It was a skinny thing, you know. It, it, Colin was attracted to him. And, you know, he was, he, he, you know, 
sexually assaulted him on a weekly basis. You know, he was fucking him. And obviously he had HIV and he gave Colin HIV. And Colin either only ever slept with him or a very small number of people. So it showed that really what what the reality of the time was. HIV and contracting HIV through sex was Russian roulette. You know, it was a case of you could have sex with one person ever and contract HIV. Or you could have sex with hundreds of guys and not get HIV. You know, but at the time we didn't know that. It wasn't like I've said a couple of times in this video to affirm the point. <laughs> it wasn't until later on it became, we became more aware. That's why condom use, I think, wasn't really discussed very much in the series. And not until the end, you know, where they started to wear condoms and stuff. But the third character, who was the protagonist, who actually died last... <laughs> If you recall, he was in complete denial about it. Now, that was the case. There was, in the early days, a lot of denial in the community about what was happening, you know. But there was also a lot of fear as well. And there was, if you remember, the guys who were who were starting to talk about it were ridiculed by the rest of the community, you know, for, for doing that. And even though, even, you know, later on, there was a lot of shaming of guys like me who were doing the sexual health promotion you know, we were called the condom police and 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 all kinds of shit like that you know basically you know um criticized for 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 what we were doing because we were you know shaming guys you know because they were not having because they were having unsafe sex you know so you know he his character interestingly enough had sex with loads of people and at the end jill who was my favourite character and Colin was my favourite character Jill confronts the mum now the mum doesn't tell Jill that he has died until the next day even though she knows he's she's staying on the Isle of Wight because she wants to see her, her, her good friend you know and at the end Jill confronts her and said it was shame that killed your son and you killed your son you killed your son through through your homophobia and your bigotry, basically, you know, because he felt ashamed of being gay and he felt ashamed of who he was, you know, and he went on to infect hundreds of guys with HIV because he knew he had HIV, but he was still not wearing condoms and having safer sex because of shame, because of the shame of the bigotry of him being gay and the shame of him having HIV, you know, and in, in, in a lot of respects that is very true. You know, as as the virus progressed and as time wore on, you know, we'd then, by 1991, we'd faced like 10 years of, of vehement homophobia directed at our community, at my community, you know. And when I came out in 92, it was still just as bad as that. And even when I was volunteering, as I did from literally six months after I came out as gay, I was volunteering at HIV charities, you know, because I was so upset about what was going on um, in my community about it and you know 1500 gay men a year were dying T towards the mid 90s just before the um, vaccinations the not the vaccinations the um, medications came in and they were the early days of the medication and the early days of the medications, people were taking 30 to 40 tablets a day you know like it was hardcore and my friend Paul died literally weeks months weeks before those medications became widely available I mean he was on AZT which didn't work you know and he was 29 30 when he died in the prime of his life you know so 1500 of us a year were dying you know and The stigma of discrimination was, was horrific. You know, the story of a funeral, like I said in my previous video, happened. That happened a lot, you know, I you know, because I volunteered and I was part of these organisations that were doing the work supporting people and, and, and doing, like, buddying and, and, and welfare rights advice and practical help, you know, returning to Trust, to do a lot of things 
for people who were living with HIV at the time because they were basically very, very ill. Not like they are today, you know, so they couldn't do things. So people would go around and do their gardens, clean their houses, buy their shopping. You know, the stories that they would tell about, about the family rejection, the homophobia they'd experienced and stuff, it broke my heart. It was horrible. I mean, I really can't emphasize how, how horrible it was. And, and watching those five episodes really brought it home to me, really reminded me. And I'd forgotten, I'd forgotten, I'd forgotten how bad it was. And it reminded me of how awful it was, you know. So the series didn't over over exaggerate what was going on. I think it was really accurate and fair in in what it portrayed. And you know, I really believe the younger gay male community, bisexual male community, should be forced to watch this. They should really know what us, what we put up with, what what people over the age of forty, forty five probably say 45 years old, what we put up with, what we dealt with, what we had to face in terms of of it, you know, and the trauma of it as well is massive, you know, and and it was true, you know, a lot of guys felt shame, a lot of guys felt shame, a lot of guys did not use condoms, did not do anything like that because they were ashamed of being gay, they felt a deep shame at being gay and, and like she said, you know, they thought they deserved it. They deserved to get this disease and die. You know, not like just die quickly. <laughs> no, 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 no. They didn't just decide to die. Deserve to die quickly like you do if you shoot yourself in the head with a gun. No, they, they had to die horrible, slow, painful deaths. You know, withering away to nothing. Basically disappearing into nothing from being healthy guys to being little sticks who could barely breathe covered in lesions dying horrible deaths in their own fucking shit and piss in hospital beds you know dying alone you know that is what 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 was going on and that is because society was so fucking homophobic at the time it was horribly homophobic you know and we really have to acknowledge that and i think as a community especially as a gay male community we really need to acknowledge that and we really need to hold people to account for that you know and and to make matters worse <laughs> the government brought in section 28 which basically prohibited schools colleges local authorities talking about the word they use promoting homosexuality as a viable op viable alternative to the heterosexual lifestyle you know and margaret thatcher there's a you can youtube it there's a famous clip where she's talking over 1987 conservative party conference and she says people have an inalienable people believe they have an inalienable right to be lesbian and gay and this isn't right yes I mean, that is why I'm, I'm ever, never, ever, ever, ever going to vote Conservative, ever in my life. Because I cannot forgive them for that. And you might think, well, what's that got to do with what I've just said? It's got everything to do with it. Because this was 1988. This was at the peak of the HIV crisis, you know. Just before the AZT came along, which wasn't that effective anyway. And, and, and like almost 10 years before the combination therapy came along. You know, so all these young men, all these young gay and bisexual men in school and college were not getting a sexual health message. Not even getting, a, let alone getting a sexual health message. They weren't even getting a, a message that it was okay to be gay. There was no support available. There was no, no education around LGBT issues. So young people in the education system had no idea about lgbt stuff you know nothing no idea whatsoever so they didn't have a context to work with you know so when you're getting the majority of messages from media and society and probably your family that is dirty queer dirty this day filthy horrible homosexuals you know you don't get anything to balance that and the education system should have done that. The education system should have done 
a fair balance and talked about those issues, but it couldn't because it's Section 28. So that caused more people to die, you know. So, you know, but going back to the program, I've talked for 20 minutes, bloody hell. But going back to the program, it was really good in how it portrayed it. Obviously so good it's got me riled up about it. And I feel <laughs> very angry about that time, really angry about that time and what it did to us. But on another level, I feel incredibly proud as well. I feel incredibly proud of my community in the way we dealt with that, you know. Um, we we got off our asses and we helped each other, basically. Mm. We got off our asses and became proactive and looked for, for solutions to what was going on, you know, look, looked at how we could promote messages of safety and look after each other and all the sexual health stuff that we have today is a result of the gay and bisexual men who got off their asses and did something, basically. All right, thank you.